Hello there and welcome to my Ancestors Legacy review. Ancestors Legacy is a Viking themed RTS game which released on the 22nd of May 2018 and is developed by Destructive Creations and published by 1C Company. Ancestors Legacy is centered around four playable nations, the Vikings, the Anglo-Saxons, the Germans and the Slavs. Each of these nations have their own unique playstyle, units, abilities, strengths and weaknesses and each comes with their own set of campaign missions which are centered around historical events. Now for this review, I'll start off discussing the basic mechanics of the game and then cover some of the campaign missions that you'll encounter. I'm done waiting. Let's go there. Ancestors Legacy feels instantly familiar for fans of RTS games. The core of the game is much like any other. You have a base where you can create buildings, these buildings allow you to create different units, and these different units will be used to capture things and destroy the enemy. Now to create and build units, you'll need resources. There's three resources to manage, wood, food and iron. Wood is largely used to create buildings and units, food is used to maintain units, and iron is used to upgrade units and unlock technologies. Resource gathering is largely automated. You don't control or assign villagers to them directly as you would in, say, a Age of Empires game. Rather, you can capture and control villages that are dotted throughout the maps. These villages then connect to resources such as woodcutters, farms, and mines that, after a small payment, villagers will begin working. As these villages are your source of income, they are what you'll be primarily defending and capturing. Villages also allow you to replenish troops, so they're a vital part of keeping your momentum as you press outwards. Each village can be upgraded with towers and defenses, allowing them to hold out from a capture a bit longer. For full defense, you can ring the bell and all the villagers will retreat into the village center, fortifying it and doing more damage to the enemy with tower fire. Now what's particularly interesting about this is that the resources are placed outside of the village centers. So if you're fast enough, you can raid the outer resources first, kill the villagers, then push in on the village center so its defenses remain low. What good is ringing the bell if there's nobody there to hear it? Now even if some of them do make it back, you're still denying the enemy their resources while they protect the village center, which is a very interesting dynamic. Now because food is used to maintain units, you can actually cut it off from the enemy and start starving them. When this happens, their units lose their morale and get a series of debuffs that make them extremely ineffective at fighting. So again, just another interesting dynamic to the resources. The last thing to cover on the economy side of things is base building. Each base has predetermined slots for buildings. Once you click to build something, your villagers will just construct it where it's already set out to be. This actually works very well in Ancestor's Legacy. I initially assumed that it was more limiting and you'd eventually build everything and not have much choice. But because the game is tightly balanced in its economy, you do have to make tough choices of what to build and when. Placement just doesn't really matter. You have to constantly juggle building units, defenses, houses, base buildings and researching new technologies all for a very finite amount of resources. And depending on your enemy and how the match is going, your strategy may change and often it will. While the economy side of things is quite automated in terms of its physical aspect of placing villagers and buildings, the battle side is anything but. For starters, units all have health, which is tracked on each man individually, food, which is consumed by each man individually, morale, which is determined by the unit, a facing direction to allow for flanks and side-on attacks, and then the different types of units have different abilities and sometimes multiple, such as shield walls, fear, chase, throwing axes, and a bunch of others. Then, as a unit fights, it can be upgraded to focus defense, offense, or speed. You can also kit it out with more armor, level 2 or level 3, which is actually placed on the unit and looks really, really cool. They can change stances between offensive or defensive stance to block charges and find traps. Archers can do friendly fire, and units can lay traps themselves, and everyone can use torches to see farther at night. Terrain plays an important part as well, where walking in water or hiding in bushes gives certain buffs and debuffs. So when you throw all of this into the pot with four factions that have different units and some unique unit classes, you get a very good mix of playstyles clashing over resources. Fighting is very fast paced and is an extremely bloody affair. You can watch the fights by zooming in with the action camera and seeing a really gritty and dark version of the battle, which is pretty cool, but it's typically best left for the campaign as in skirmish and multiplayer, you'll be far too busy to zoom in. Now generally speaking, the fighting is all about triggering your abilities and positioning against the enemy. A flank crushes an enemy most of the time, and abilities can help turn the tide when you're evenly matched. Once two units get engaged in combat, those units are locked in until one dies or you force a retreat, and some units can't retreat or they can actually stop the enemy from retreating. 
Now, if a unit dies, that's a big blow to your economy, as replenishing a unit is far cheaper and it will keep its upgrades, whereas if it dies, you lose their experience and their armor. In the Annihilation mode, your goal is to destroy the enemy town center, but in Domination, which I feel is much more fun, your goal is to maintain more villages than the enemy and bleed their tickets out. This creates a much more interesting gameplay where large defenses are built on key villages and stalemates can occur. Even though the combat is super fast paced, these battles can still last 40 minutes or more if you're evenly matched. Before we get into the campaign, I want to preface it by saying that I've just never particularly enjoyed RTS campaigns much. I enjoy single players, but when it comes to Age of Empires, Company of Heroes or Cossacks, I really haven't thought much about why, but I've always ended up playing multiplayer more in those games and stopped playing the single player completely in their sequels. This campaign is as polished and varied as the ones I've mentioned, just may not be from my style of play. So, long as you know that, let's get into it. Each campaign has 5 chapter missions in it that range from around 20 minutes to 40 minutes of playtime, and with some of the nations having 2 campaigns, there's a grand total of 30 missions, currently with more to be added later down the line and you can change the difficulty for added challenge. Destructive Creations asks that reviewers don't spoil the story for the mission, so I'll try not to, but I wanted to touch on how the campaigns play and some of the unique gameplay aspects. Each mission tries to provide something different to the gameplay, be it stealth, timed attacks, wave defense, or a heavier story plot point like saving a character or assassinating someone. Now for me, they could be a little bit hit and miss. Some of the missions I thought were excellent, my favorite still being to protect allied Drakars from artillery as they storm a beach. It was intense, fast paced, and I barely did it. Others can be really arduous, like walking through a forest, finding traps at an extremely slow pace. The voice work can be a little bit rough, and so can the stories, and I'm not sure I particularly cared for some of the twists and reveals, but the cutscenes look brilliant, and every now and then there is something unexpected and interesting, with some characters betraying each other in the middle of the battle, and I actually did learn a few things when it came to the Slavs campaign, as that's a period of history I'm not too well versed in. Now typically each campaign ends in a big battle, and those can be quite fun and cool to see, as the game just throws units and units at your disposal. At the end of all of it, I did feel like the campaigns just served as a nice way to introduce you to the four nations and get you familiar with their mechanics. I can't say that I'll really remember much of what I did other than a very few small instances. The multiplayer in Ancestors Legacy is fast paced and a lot of fun. It's hard to say what kind of longevity it has, but there are enough systems to separate skilled players and good players can do a lot on the battlefield to encourage lengthy play times and earning late game technologies. There's currently two modes, Annihilation and Domination, and you can customize a few of the starting conditions to tailor the experience across 10 maps. The maps are built for certain sized players, ranging from 1v1, 2v2, and 3v3 sized games. Individual players have their own leveling system associated with the four factions, and you can filter games by their level, so you can hopefully find games with people of a similar experience to you. It seems to me though that there's no progression system at all, which I think is a real missed opportunity. Obtaining some sort of colors or skins or tattoos for your guys might provide a little bit more incentive you know, to work towards something, or a ranking system that can increase or decrease with wins and losses would be great. And as always, smaller games like this one do have the risk of having little to no player base after a few weeks, so I might do a follow up multiplayer battle in a while just to see how the multiplayer scene is progressing. I do think there is great potential for it though. Unfortunately, it does have to be mentioned that when playing multiplayer, the game did crash and error out a lot, around 60% of the time in multiplayer, most of the time at the very beginning of the match. Now, I'm sure this would be fixed, but it's just something I couldn't overlook as it happened so frequently on the launch day. Moving in Hearts of Iron, but he doesn't, he just instant tell, okay, this game just crashed again. I don't know, I don't know. If... That's, that's three crashes in a row and one disconnection like straight away. The art style of Ancestors Legacy is excellent. It's a dark and gritty game that doesn't shy away from brutal violence and some of the darker aspects of war. Graphically speaking, the game looks great. Troop models have a lot of detail and change over time with blood and armor being added to them. The animations in combat line up really well with other troops and are appropriately vicious. You can tell it's the minds behind hatred here, <laughs> especially when they're killing villagers. Buildings and destructions look great as well, as do the environments, from battered coastlines to pillaged farmlands, and you'd instantly know what period the game is set in from just looking around. 
The UI is really clear and effective at letting you know what's going on in battle. The only thing is that it's slightly hard to read um, all the little status effects that appear on a unit. They're present when you hover over the unit in your bottom tray, but the game comes with a PDF manual showing you what they mean, and there's a lot of them, so I think it might have been better if you kind of had a tooltip UI on there somewhere, such as hovering over it, as I found myself not really knowing what a lot of the effects were doing. Now the menus themselves feel a little bit bare bones as well, with almost debug looking sliders and text around the place, but ultimately it is functional and clear on what it does. Ancestors Legacy offers a fun and engaging RTS experience with great potential for multiplayer. It's extremely responsive in battle, it runs smoothly, has greatly fleshed out units and mechanics, and a unique spin on resource control that creates a clear skill gap between players. The campaign, while it has its ups and downs, can feel a little bit like busy work without any real goal or reward for completing, and as mentioned, time will tell if players stick around for the multiplayer on its own without any real sense of progression other than a simple leveling system. The core experience is great. If you enjoy RTS games, you will have a good time with Ancestors Legacy, but I think a lot of its longevity will hinge on there being an active multiplayer scene. That's it for my review of Ancestors Legacy. Please let me know what you think of the game and the review in the comments below. And if you want, you can vote in the YouTube card poll that's on screen now to see what other people think of the score. It's always quite a fun thing to do. As always, thank you for the ongoing support on Patreon and Twitch. And for those using my affiliate link with CD Keys, you can get games such as this one for 50% off. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.